A Missionary Called by Joseph Center Part 1, Chapter 4 Everyone thinks the weather is worst in their own state. Either it is too hot or too cold, too rainy or too dry, or, for us Michiganders, too totally freaking everything and predictability was a sham. Graduation Sunday was supposed to be perfect. It was Friday, they said, that was going to be wet. Instead, Friday was perfect. You could have had a beautiful ride out to work on your scooter. And today, graduation Sunday, the rain came down in sheets and still as stiflingly hot as ever. Commencement got moved to the gymnasium, where there was just no way that the air conditioning would have been fixed. Only hours earlier, we were in the kitchen, just back from church. I was looking out the window, lamenting the hours I would be spending still in suit and tie, all the worse for the vinyl robe and stupid little cat over it all. You were rummaging for plates. The china, really just a mishmash of glass and plasticware that had somehow survived our sometimes violent house over the years, clattered in your hands. What's Tommy doing next year? I turned from the window to rattle around a drawer for matching forks. Heading out to Harvard, if you can believe it. Lightning exploded and shot the kitchen through with burning white on instant light. Thunder crashed. The pouring rain drummed on the roof and garage and issued a fine mist through the window screen. How's he going to manage that? Full ride. You didn't see the article in the paper? No. Perfect test scores. Valedictorian. Never told any of us about the scholarships. Is he working this summer? You had trouble sliding the napkins into place on the damp table. He's got all the money he needs, I answered, and found the forks and momentarily leaned back against the sink for a break, letting the rain's mist gauze over my neck and shoulders. Still cheating the pot machines? I laughed. He drives 45 miles each way every couple weeks to exchange quarters, plus his annual Walmart scam. You hoisted yourself up to sit on the counter. He's going to get in trouble. Better sooner than later, I guess. I imagined Tommy cheating his eventual law firm and getting indicted by a co-worker. Not that I knew a thing about how law firms work. A timer buzzed. I stopped to pull the meatloaf from the oven. You were just finishing up the salad. We carried the food out to the table and laid it out. You check on Dad? I asked. He's about ready. Just needs his tie tied. I went through the kitchen to the back of the house. Dad's bedroom was a spectacular muddle. Clean at the particulate level, but cluttered to the extreme. Hundreds of newspapers stacked in towers across the floor and walls, atop shelves and at the foot of his bed. Rolls of watercolor paintings rubber-banded by the dozen. Tubes and trays of pigments covered his desk, surrounding the latest work, a great, gaudy Rorschach blot. There was a crummy plate with the rinds from the most recently consumed toast. Altogether, it smelled of newsprint, wet paint, dusty ventilation, and grape jelly. He stood staring at himself in the mirror over his dresser, which appeared through a valley of mountainously stacked and neatly folded tiny squares of newsprint. His arms, like his tie, hung limp and useless. Need some help, Dad? His reflection looked over his shoulder at me. He started to raise a hand, but it shook so badly that he gave up and dropped it. I imagined, indulgently, an intention to say hello or, Hey, how you doing, son? I can never get the knot right. He never opened his mouth, and I stood behind him and reached up and around. I knotted the tie, straightening and adjusting, and tucked the narrow end into place. Dad stared blankly. Dinner's ready. It's Sunday. Meatloaf. Like always. He looked perplexed. Childlike. His usual expression. I tried to read something into it, though I knew there was nothing. I couldn't help myself. Uh, we came home from church early. I said, so dinner's now, graduation at one, that's what the tie's for. The graduates took a section of bleachers opposite the parents, families, and whoever else's, and were a sea of bright, rain-streaked red. The windows along the ceiling were a great segmented aluminum silver frame around a long, inky black canvas, which fitfully burst white with lightning. The rain beat the corrugated roof and echoed against the cinder block walls and hardwood floor. I'd already helped you and Dad find seats before crossing to my alphabetized place with my classmates. I could hear the program shaking in Dad's hands as I walked away. Ellie was already there, sitting in her place. I saw her watching me. No Tommy or Casper yet? I asked as I approached. You sure Tommy's coming at all? 
She sat behind me with her knees in my back. What about his speech? I don't know. Has he said anything about it? No. Casper's probably just late, she said. The band played slowly and softly and blended with the noise of the whispering crowd. The collective breath and noise joined the oppressive humidity and swirled. Ellie leaned forward. When's your interview? Tomorrow at 10. Gonna be able to get up that early? You think I'm going to fall asleep? I leaned back against her legs, and she rested her chin on my shoulder. Her breath was pineapple lifesavers. The band stopped. The superintendent stepped behind the podium and welcomed us. Ellie kissed my cheek and sat back. The loudspeakers of any high school gymnasium are terrible, like a series of telephones jacked up and rattling through a string of Tommy's empty pop cans. The narrowed frequency and tinny overtones of the superintendent's baritone must have killed Dad's ears. I couldn't see you among the crowd, but knew your arm must be around his shoulders. Events like this always make me anxious. I must get it from Dad. For some reason, maybe it's just me and Dad, anxiety in the moment brings anxiety for the whole. Let's see if I can explain that. I wished we could just skip everything. And not just now, but fast forward the next three or four months of my life. The whole next three or four months, and just leave. I thought about the bookstore. I'd be there tomorrow. In the moment of my interview, I didn't want to go. Though a full half, at least, of me inwardly roared in triumph, I really did not want to go. Once I was gone... Gone from here, home, school, city, state, and once I'd received my mission call and pulled through the last of home and stepped aboard the airplane to Salt Lake City, I would be okay. I would be okay. Everything would work out from there. I'd be gone for two years, I'd come back stronger, I'd head off for college, I'd get away from Amalith, start totally new somewhere else. I still hadn't told her yet, though, Ellie, about going. About going on a freaking mission. I had no idea how to tell her. You said I better not wait. Not if I wanted to keep her. But how to broach the monster-sized topic of my proselytizing mission to somewhere anywhere on the great, vast, and practically endless planet Earth and why in the world would I do something so extreme eluded me. No one else had called back on my job applications. I'd gotten them out too late. I'd forgotten. End of school, finals, graduation. It was just the bookstore. Cistercian booksellers. The only other possible employment option was Anscar's, and I couldn't work for Anscar's, not like Casper. My weekly landscaping duties in our own backyard, the cemetery, and on behalf of the Historical Society, did enough damage to my body as it was. So considering my love for books, one could claim, perhaps, that it was fate or destiny that my only possible vehicle for a summer of money saving was a bookstore. If fate it was then I am friggin' fated for hell. I squeezed Ellie's ankles. She pressed her knees into the soft spots below my shoulder blades and leaned forward. Careful down there, she whispered. I haven't shaved in a few weeks.